Okay, we're now at part 120, and this is line 18A3Q. Equivalence, principle, g-force, relativity, Miles Mathis series, Wow Seti. And this is based on the Wow Seti 1977 radio alien signal. I find the math equations, take the answer to it, and Google them to see what comes up. There's a lot of people just joining the series now. There is over 120 videos for the Wow Seti signal, plus there's a bunch of others um, from the signal that I sent back in December. So if you want to start at the very beginning, you would go to the index at SETI Wow Alien Contact Index ideagirl.blogspot.com. And I uh, have them starting from number one all the way up and they're posted on the blog so on each blog post you'll have the the title the tags the video and then all the notes along with the uh, links and stuff about what's been posted and this is the most recent one is 17r is up on the blog so i am blogging a little bit behind from what i'm filming okay so, um, the de development of gravitational theory. So we're going to look up this um, word to see what it means. Something like the equivalence principle emerged in the late 16th and early 17th centuries when Galileo expressed experimentally that the acceleration of a test mass due to gravitation is independent of the amount of mass being accelerated. These findings led to gravitational theory in which the inertial and gravitational masses are identical. Okay, there's quite a bit there. Um, the equivalence principle proper was introduced by Albert Einstein in 1907 when he observed that the acceleration of bodies towards the center of the Earth at a rate of 1 g, which equals 9.81 meters per second squared, being a standard at reference of gravitational acceleration at the Earth's surface is equivalent to the acceleration of an inertially moving body that would be observed on a rocket in free space being accelerated at a rate of 1 g. Einstein stated it thus, we assume the complete physical equivalence of gravitational field and a corresponding acceleration of the reference system, which he wrote in 1907. That is being at rest on the surface of the earth is equivalent to being inside of a spaceship far from any sources of gravity that is being accelerated by its engines. So from this principle, Einstein deduced that free fall is actually inertial motion. Okay, I'm not going to go into every single thing. This is on Wikipedia if you want to read it. Um, he talks about the Newtonian mechanics, the gravity assumed to be a force, and so on. The next thing is Einstein combined postulated the equivalence principle with special relativity to predict the clocks run at different rates in a gravitational potential and light rays bend in a gravitational field even before he developed the concept of curved space-time. In general relativity, objects in free fall follow geodisks of space-time and what we perceive as the force of gravity is instead a result of our being unable to follow those geodisks of space-time because the mechanical resistance of matter prevents us from doing so. A non-inertial reference frame is a frame of reference that is undergoing acceleration with respect to an inertial frame. I had to look it up to see what it means and I still don't know what it means. An accelerometer at rest is a non-inertial frame will in general detect a non-zero and in a curved space-time, all frames are not inertial. So I looked up some more to see what we came up with. And it says, detection of a non-inertial frame, need for fictitious forces, that a given frame is non-inertial can be detected by its need for fictitious forces to explain observed motions. So it talks about the rotation of Earth uh, using a Foucault pendulum. And so I looked up Foucault's pendulum, and this is what came up. And quotes to read, new theory to increase g-force space travel with relativity, mathematical new equation ideas. So in the 1950s, Maurice Alias discovered a variation in pendulum motion during his work with the antitrospic 
paraconeal pendulum, pendulum. Sorry, the most important variation was discovered during a solar eclipse. Okay. So he uses these variations to propose that neither Newtonian nor Einsteinian, Einsteinian gravitational mechanics were complete. He presented a theory that centered on the idea of a sort of ether, or what he called an anisotropy an an of space. According to him, this required a reassessment of the experiments of Michelson, Morley, and Miller, and most importantly, of the theory underlying relativity. So what he's going to do, uh, Miles Mathis wrote this. He says, I'm going to show you that Newton's famous gravitational equation is a compound equation that expresses both the gravitational field and the EM field. I will separate the two fields mathematically showing the distinct equations and how they fit together. I will then do a relativistic transform on each new field, showing that a new relative field equation can be achieved directly without tensors or any difficult math. I will then reunify these two relative field equations into a unified field equation, which I'll show is just Newton's classical field with a simple transform. Once that is done, I will derive the new number for g by novel means, showing that the gravitational acceleration, newly divorced from the acceleration caused by the electrical field, must be greater than 9.8. I will show that this is because the gravitational field and the electrical field are in vector opposition. My thoughts. I wrote these February the 9th. Now that I know we need two geoforce, according to one of the comments, to sustain the right speeds for rotating UFO engine spaceship, I'll be looking for people's theories that mention velocity and g-force during the next Google searches. I happen to come across Miles Mathis' blog. He talks about physics, people not listening to anyone's theories unless they are educated. Maybe that's why it's taken us over 200 years to do the theories written by men in the 17th century. It's time to look outside the box. The universe gives messages to those who listen. It doesn't care if you're educated. I know if I was, I'd probably take a look at this and say it's impossible based on my earthly calculations. I pulled out some of Miles' data from his blog and book excerpts that relate to the WOW SETI Build a UFO Engine project. Please take a look at Miles Mathis series and mathematical calculations in his PDF files or books. He mentions many things that we've discussed in the last 120 videos in this series. The WOW SETI signals data is in relation to his work, so it has to mean something. Now these are his books. The Unfield, un unfield Field and Other Problems. And that's Miles Mathis there. His other book is called The Incorporation of Light, How to Bring Light into the Unfield Field Equations, including the L. Uh, Gregorian. Uh, the Greatest Standing Errors in Physics and Mathematics by Miles Mathis. Data to read. Quotes from Miles Mathis to look at. This is what I want you to look at when, in his material. For the past 80 years or so, the great problem in creating an unfield field theory has been including gravity in it. The quantum field is now the primary field in the eyes of most physics physicists. And the problem is writing equations that include gravity in the quantum field. Another thing he talks about is now that I have shown a couple of experimental proofs of my assertion, let us look at the mathematical proof. We will start with Newton's equation. Newton's famous gravity equation is a heuristic equation and Newton admitted that from the very beginning. F equals g m m forward slash r2. In the basic force equation, F equals m a equals m s forward slash t2. The distance is in the numerator. Again, somewhat strange, but strangest of all is the constant g, a tiny number with lots of mysterious parameters. G equals 6.67 times 10 to minus 11 to the power of minus 11 m cubed forward slash kgs squared. 
And this is the link that I found about him when I googled that number, like the mathematical equation number. This came up, so the on-field theory, theory by Miles Mathis, and again he talks about what he's going to do, and then I open it up to see what he had to say. And I was very excited because we were talking about the G-force and how, how I didn't know how to create a G-force for a UFO. So um, it was exciting to have this come up to show me um, what kind of mathematical equations he does to get to that point and actually to explain to me what a G-force was. To begin with, we are given an angular velocity w, which is a velocity expressed in radians by the equation w equals 2 pi forward slash t. Then we want an equation to go from linear velocity v to angular velocity w. Since v equals 2 pi r forward slash t, the equation must be v equals rw. You can email him at mm at milesmathis.com if you want to talk to him about this uh, theory that he has or what he's been working on, okay? Yeah, he's quite important because his stuff is coming up in the Wild Study Signal, so it's going to be part of this UFO engine. And whatever he's been writing obviously has something to do with what we need. Um, these are the tags for this uh, module as mass, Albert Einstein, Galileo, G-force, gravitation, non-inertial reference frame, Maurice Elias, Newtonian or Einsteinian gravitational mechanics, anastrophic periconium pendulum in unified field theory. That's what I pulled out from it. Okay, and also the video before this is line 18A3P, the Gray's Great Fido UFO alien contact message. The reason I'm going to um, reiterate that is because the equation that comes up in it is a um, there was two videos that I did. One was a mathematical equation about velocity and this one explains the formula that you need to get the velocity. So I really don't know too much about this stuff but I'm just posting it up for you guys to take a look at and you can figure it out. Okay and we'll go on to the next video now.